Thank you, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, can you guys see the my PowerPoint here? Yep, looks clear. All right, cool. Uh, so I'm going to get started. So as uh, you said, I'm Jeff Chick from the University of Washington, and today I'm going to talk about endoscopic interventions and specifically biliary interventions. So I certainly have a lot of people to thank in this uh, space, a lot of people who taught me how to do this uh, and who are leading the uh, front in these interventions as well. So here are a couple of them. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the indications for biliary interventions, talk a little bit about the patients and the equipment that we use, show a couple of the steps, and then finally show a few, uh, a variety of clinical cases. So if you look at the literature, actually endoscopic involvement or endoscopic procedures in the IR are not particularly new. Uh, so they were described in 1973, and they continue up till today uh, with almost 50 publications in the past five years or so. And many of them are by the interventional radiology colleagues and in IR journals. So when you use endoscopy uh, in IR, you can use it for a variety of different indications. You can use it in the biliary tree. You can use it in the gastrointestinal system. You can use it in the genital urinary system. And you can come up with a whole variety of other uses as well. The key benefit here is that it provides direct visualization to the organ of interest. So obviously, uh, interventional radiologists are experts in ultrasound and CT and MRI, and this provides just another approach to directly visualizing the procedures that we do. So anytime you're involved in any kind of endoscopic procedure that includes biliary or otherwise, you should certainly have a multidisciplinary discussion with the surgeons or the gastroenterologists. Uh, or a variety of other folks, because it's it's helpful when this is a collaborative approach. Um, most of the patients that we do endoscopic interventions in typically have multiple comorbidities. They're uh, poor uh, cardiac uh, or anesthetic uh, patients. Uh, so they come to us uh, as a surgical, uh, as a different, so they don't have to undergo surgery, essentially. So we get our standard workups, uh, blood counts, and basic metabolic panels and coagulation studies like we do for any interventions that we perform. So there are a whole uh, variety of endoscopic equipments out there uh, that can be broken down into flexible and rigid scopes. Uh, and they can also be broken down into reusable and uh, disposable scopes. So they change in range from 7.9 French, which is relatively small, all the way up to the rigid endoscope, which is 22.5 French. And then we have a variety of different devices that can go through the endoscopes. They're including baskets, stone breaking devices, and a variety of lasers. Uh, so this is, uh, if you use a reusable scope, uh, the flexible scopes or the rigid endoscopes, this is what the towers look like. Uh, they come from the operating room. Uh, these are the scopes that many of the gastroenterologists or urologists use, uh, and we can use them as well. And they consist of a monitor and a variety of equipment to hook up the endoscope and to uh, view what you're doing. So here's just a couple of the endoscopes that we use. So this is one of the standard uh, reusable flexible endoscopes. This is a ureteroscope. Uh, this is one of the scopes that the urologists use. Uh, most of them have this tail where you can sort of uh, fan the uh, beam to see what you're looking at. They also have an attachment area where we attach a camera and a light source as well. Uh, this is one of the original disposable uh, scopes. Uh, this is the litho view. This is kind of the predecessor to the spyglass discover, which many of us use today. Uh, and this is a scope that comes with its own monitor. This is also a urology based scope. Uh, it's a single use scope uh, and it's very easy to use kind of off the shelf. This is the newest item on the market or relatively new in the past couple of years. This is a spyglass discover. Uh, this is a short uh, disposable uh, flexible endoscope. Uh, this is the scope that we use for many of the biliary interventions uh, or a variety of interventions anywhere. Uh, it's a single use scope. It comes with its own uh, sort of hookup here for saline, which is a benefit. It has its own lithotriptor or stone breaking device, and it can hook directly to your PAC system. Uh, so this is pretty much a game changer in this field. Uh, so this is one of the uh, reusable scopes. This is the workhorse flexible scope. This is a 16.5 French. Uh, scope and this is also a fantastic scope for biliary work for uh, urologic work for gastrointestinal work as well and this is in contradistinction contradistinction to the rigid endoscope this is a 22.5 french rigid endoscope uh, this is also a reusable scope and this is the best scope for uh, removing gallstones and uh, also for removing a variety of staghorn calculi or uh, renal calculi in general so typically before we perform any of these interventions, whether it's in the biliary tree or outside the biliary tree, we give antibiotics. Uh, you can or you can use anesthesia, but you don't absolutely don't have to. Uh, in the past, we typically used to uh, place oral gastric tubes and rectal tubes. 
to prevent electrolyte derangements. Some centers do this, some don't. We place a bear hug around the patient to keep them warm. Uh, in the case of some of the reusable scopes, uh, we use pressurized saline to power the scopes. In the case of the spyglass discover, it has its own irrigation system. We place cranial drapes on the patient uh, to sort of uh, clean up the mess so there isn't water everywhere. So these are some of the pressurized saline bags that help run some of the uh, reusable scopes essentially so you can see what you're doing and so it clears debris from the scope itself. So uh, initially we place these cranial drapes on the patient uh, so that the patient uh, stays water free and so your angio suite doesn't get covered with water. Uh, some of the flexible scopes and the reusable scopes, we white balance them and then we sort of adjust the uh, focus so you can see what you're looking at. The spyglass discover and some of the other single use scopes don't require this step. And then we get access to what we're doing. So whether this is the biliary tree, whether this is the gallbladder, whether this is the stomach or whether this is the, uh, the kidney, uh, we get access to the uh, structure. It can be in the same setting. It can be, they can previously had a tube in place. Uh, and then we dilate up the track using a variety of dilation balloons. This is an example of the Bard X-Force balloon, which is up a 30 French balloon or up to a 30 French balloon uh, for access for either the flexible endoscopes or for the rigid endoscopes. Uh, then we get to work. So we put the um, either the flexible scope or the rigid scope into the organ of interest. Uh, and we can see direct visualization of what we're looking at, whether that's gallstones, whether that's cholelithiasis in the biliary tree, whether that's kidney stones, or whether that's some sort of foreign body in the stomach. And then through these devices go a whole bunch of different uh, additional devices, uh, encircle graspers, or essentially a stone uh, grasping device. Uh, we can use a variety of lithotriptors, which are stone breaking devices. And we can use a variety of lasers, such as the CO2 laser or the homium laser, which are also foreign body and stone breaking devices. It's just an example of one of uh, the baskets. This is a zero tip basket, which is a night and all basket. There's also the interval grasper and a variety of other baskets as well. And you can kind of see the basket in action here. This is either uh, grabbing a stone in the biliary tree or in the uh, general urinary system or in the gallbladder and pulling them out through the scope. Uh, we also have a variety of nets and other devices. Uh, this is a Roth net, uh, which is um, from gastroenterology, and this can be particularly useful for removing bezoars or a variety of other devices, uh, gallstones in particular. This is just an example of a couple of lithotriptors here. Uh, so you can see a uh, lithotriptor here, which is a stone breaking uh, device, uh, which fragments the stones into a variety of uh, smaller pieces. And then we can remove them either with balloons or with baskets or with graspers or so forth. This is an ultrasound uh, based uh, coring element, also known as a lithotriptor here. It cores uh, into the stones themselves, that could be gallstones or biliary stones or kidney stones, and it helps core through them and sort of break them into pieces, which again can subsequently be removed. And then finally, this is just an example of one of the lasers here. This is the homium laser, uh, which is also a foreign body or stone breaking device. Uh, the lasers focus on the stone of interest or the foreign body of interest and then fragment it into pieces here. Uh, and it can also be subsequently removed uh, either with baskets or graspers or balloons or afterwards or so forth. Uh, so after we do the various procedures, after we remove the foreign bodies or remove the stones or look around or take biopsies, uh, typically we leave some sort of drainage catheter in the organ of interest afterwards. That could be an internal external biliary drain, that could be a cholecystostomy, that could be a gastrostomy, that could be a nephrostomy. Uh, and that just helps uh, decompress the system uh, and reduce sort of any infectious complications afterwards. And then subsequently, over the course of one or two weeks, we bring the patient back, downsize the drain, and subsequently remove it. So that's just kind of a quick whirlwind tour of uh, the equipment and how we do things. And I'll just show a couple of sort of bread and butter uh, biliary type cases. So this is cholecystoscopy or gallbladder endoscopy. Uh, so this is kind of the standard patient. They have recurrent cholecystitis. Uh, they have a gallbladder tube in place, it keeps coming out, and the patient has to sort of have this tube for life. So we can kind of help these patients get their tube, uh, gallstones out and get their tubes out and make them much more comfortable. So you can see the patient has a bunch of gallstones in their gallbladder. They have a cholecystostomy, which is the gallbladder tube. Uh, we subsequently remove the tube over a wire. We dilate the track uh, with the barred X-Force balloon. Uh, we then can uh, place either a Teflon or a metal uh, cannula or sheath into the gallbladder itself, and then use this rigid endoscope, the 22.5 French reusable endoscope to see the stones themselves. And then under direct visualization, we can kind of pluck them out using a variety of baskets or graspers. Uh, here you can see all the stones here. And then afterwards we can place uh, either 
just a variety of different types of drains or gallbladder drain here. This is a transistic drain, which goes into the duodenum. Uh, and then subsequently, these are removed. Uh, so this is an example of cholidocoscopy or biliary endoscopy. Uh, so this is kind of a unique case. Uh, this is a patient that had uh, jaundice and itching. Uh, they had a CT which showed multiple, essentially showed biliary dilation and multiple masses uh, throughout the biliary tree. And it was kind of, uh, everyone was unsure, including myself, what this was. Uh, so this is the patient that initially presented here. You can see biliary ductal dilation. You can see these frond-like masses throughout the biliary tree of unknown origin. Uh, so what we were asked to do is do biliary drainage um, to lower the bilirubin so the patient could subsequently get chemotherapy. Uh, so it's quite difficult to place biliary drainage catheters in this patient due to these obstructive masses. Uh, so in the process, um, we decided to look with the endoscope. Uh, so this was initially with one of the flexible endoscopes, uh, the reusable ones, and you can see these frond-like masses within the biliary tree, again, which were pretty much unknown what this was. So we took a variety of samples of this. It actually turned out to be something called bilin, uh, which I had never heard of, uh, and bilin is the precursor to cholangiocarcinoma. So interestingly enough, cholangiocarcinoma has four stages, uh, of which this is kind of the early stage. This is what cholangiocarcinoma looks like before we finally see it on CT, typically. So this was, uh, again, sort of a, uh, this was a palliative case here. And ultimately what we did was we used a variety of uh, freezing and burning probes to core our way and burn our way through the biliary tree to make paths for the biliary drainage catheters to work well and for the bile to drain effectively. Uh, so ultimately this patient could be more comfortable. Certainly this was palliative alone, uh, but after doing this intervention, uh, the patient lived for several years uh, when uh, it probably would have been unlikely without that. Uh, so you can also uh, do a variety of other biliary interventions. Here's another biliary endoscopy uh, case. Um, this is a resident or fellow uh, misstep, a great teaching case here. So this is a patient that had recurrent cholangitis, uh, and we were asked uh, to place a biliary, uh, biliary drainage catheter. So in the process of placing the biliary drainage catheter, uh, sort of standard approach here, we got access to the biliary tree, uh, used an AccuStick to place a wire, and then ultimately place a drain. Uh, during the process, the AccuStick broke uh, in the patient and it's extremely difficult to see uh, because it's radiolucent. So here we place the um, original, the LithoView scope, the disposable scope to see in the biliary tree and help find the AccuStick uh, fragment itself because it could be a nidus to infection. So this is what the biliary tree looks like under endoscopic guidance here. Uh, and we could find the component of the plastic AccuStick here. We subsequently removed it with a snare. Uh, you can see the whole component here and then we place the internal external biliary drain. So not only is this sort of a uh, standard therapeutic attempt, but it certainly helps uh, for diagnostic dilemmas or challenging uh, situations in general, such as removing foreign bodies or such as cannulating a variety of devices or areas like biliary strictures or uh, genital urinary strictures or gastrointestinal strictures as well. And then kind of, I think one final case here, um, this is sort of what the future holds or what we can do in the future. Uh, so this is cholidocoscopy um, with radiofrequency ablation. Uh, so these, this is kind of the forefront in some of our folks um, at other institutions uh, such as University of Colorado and UCLA, uh, University of Washington and Hopkins are doing some of these interventions as well. Uh, so this is a liver transplant. So these typically patients get benign biliary strictures uh, at the hepatico-jejunostomy, and they typically have these strictures which require biliary drainage essentially for life. There's no great way to treat biliary strictures. We can treat them with tubes for a very long time. We can treat them with angioplasty, but ultimately nothing really works well. So there has to be a, well, a better way to do this. Uh, so uh, this is an example of using uh, ablation, either a radio frequency wire or a laser to, to burn or remo remodel that stricture uh, so that the biliary drains can be removed. So this is a cholangiogram where you can see this biliary stricture right here, the hepatico J. When we looked with the endoscope here, you can see kind of all these band-like materials or this haziness throughout. So what we use is we use a radio frequency wire to kind of make circumferential ablations throughout here and remove the fibrous band angioplasty them afterwards, and there was good flow through this uh, previously seen strictured region. Uh, ultimately, we were able to uh, remove the biliary drainage catheter, and the patient became tube-free for life. Um, and this, I think, is a really exciting area uh, for future interventions and sort of uh, pushing the field of IR forward. 
Um, and with that, uh, that's kind of a quick overview of endoscopy and biliary endoscopy in particular. So I showed you guys a little bit about how we do patients, some of the equipment that's out there, several devices, uh, give, meaning the reusable and disposable scopes, the flexible and the rigid scopes, uh, and how essentially this can be an adjunct uh, for our current uh, image guidance. It's certainly extremely helpful and can be used nearly in any part of the body and can really uh, help our field in general and help make uh, procedures safer and faster. And as I said, you can definitely use it in any kind of uh, situation that you can imagine. Uh, myself and some of our colleagues across the uh, country have innumerable cases of kind of weird and unusual things uh, that we're happy to show you uh, at other time points. A variety of references here. And if you're interested, um, some of my colleagues and myself have published kind of like a how to do guide for several of these things. Uh, some of them um, uh, are in the literature here. And then there's a whole uh, kind of edition of techniques in vascular interventional radiology from 2019 uh, that sort of describes the process in general. Um, a few papers have come out in JVIR recently, and there continue to be more and more. Uh, we're working on some clinical trials with SIR and some collaborative databases to kind of make this uh, more mainstream throughout, of I, throughout I, all of IR. And with that, I encourage you guys to all be involved. Uh, you chose the most exciting field in all of medicine. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you again for having me, and I'm happy to answer any questions.